Ready to go. Sorry about that. Okay. So I haven't finished grading your exam yet. I'm almost finished, so you'll have your grade tonight. I will say, in my opinion, that content on that exam is the hardest of any of the exams. Um, in the last in my, in the first the last exam and the first exam are probably the easiest. In my opinion. Okay, so this, we are going to start our lecture on chapter 9. Chapter 9 is all about, <coughs> basically, business stuff. This is not, honestly, a very difficult chapter. There aren't a whole lot of real numerical problems in this chapter. Here's our big picture facts, and these should be close to your heart. We have Morgan, she's a recent college grad, and she majored in finance. She got a job with Kite Corporation, it's in sales, and we'll have some travel and client entertainment. She'll be based in a major metropolitan area in another state. Uh, Kite has no available space in the location, so she'll have to maintain her own work facility. In addition to her salary, she'll receive a travel allowance. However, Kite has made it clear that the allowance will not cover all of her expenses. Kite requires all travel expenses to be documented appropriately and submitted in a timely manner. She's happy with her new job since it will give her a flexible schedule and she can work from home. Okay, so we are going to talk in this chapter about, like I said, expenses related to your business. And there are a few different um, ways that the, these expenses will show up on a return. So this is, this is discussed in the chapter, but for some reason they put it at the very end of the chapter instead of at the beginning. And in my opinion, it should be at the beginning. So we are gonna talk about what I'm about to talk about now um, because you will honestly use it throughout the chapter. So, the first category of worker is someone who is self-employed or an independent contractor. An independent contractor is, for tax purposes, is the same thing as someone who is self-employed. Um, maybe there are some different things for legal purposes, I don't know, but I can tell you for tax purposes, they are treated identically. Now, it's easy to tell someone who's self-employed, you know, that means someone who has their own business, their own job, their sole proprietor. It's maybe not as easy to tell who's an independent contractor. And we'll talk about the tests for an independent contractor in just a minute. But what I want to talk about first is what are the tax consequences if you fall under this category. If you fall under this category, all your business expenses and income for that matter, but we're talking about expenses in this chapter, will be reported on Schedule C. So is Schedule C, is that considered to be above the line? Yes, because it's on page one of your return, right? So Schedule C, okay, that's the first category. The second category is a worker who is an employee. They do not own their own business, they are not an independent contractor. Again, in a second, we'll talk about the difference between an employee and an independent contractor. What I want to talk about right now is um, how um, the tax consequences of being an em employee versus being self-employed. Well, it depends. There are three different possibilities if you are an employee. The first possibility is an employee has a business expense. So let's say they take a client out to dinner and their employer does not pay them back for it. So we have an unreimbursed employee business expense. Unreimbursed meaning the employer does not pay them back. What are the tax consequences of having an unreimbursed expense? 
the employee can take a deduction for this expense, but it is itemized and it is subject to the 2% floor. I will tell you on your 1040 assignment, one of the taxpayers is an employee and she has some unreimbursed employee expenses that you will have to report on Schedule A as and subject to this 2% floor. So that's the first option. The second option is, well, what if it's reimbursed? So this means Frank, the employee, goes and takes a client out to lunch and his employee, employer reimburses him for it. How is, how is this going to be reported for Frank? There are two possibilities. If the employer has an accountable plan, an accountable plan, which we will talk about later, but all an accountable plan is, is it means that the employer requires certain documentation in order to be able to reimburse. An accountable plan, is, it's an actual requirement under the tax code, and it does have certain requirements that have to be met. We will talk about them probably, you know, in a week or so, because we don't have class on Monday. Remember, Monday is Easter holiday, so no class. But, <clears throat> If it is reimbursed under an accountable plan, then basically what that means is there are no tax consequences to the employee. They don't report any income for the reimbursement, and they don't take a deduction for the expense. It's a wash. We don't report it anywhere on the return. So nothing to report on the 1040. No income and no deduction. They have no, even though they are receiving a reimbursement, we don't report any income because they basically don't have to report it. We just treat it as a wash. I run out of room, so move over here. What if it is reimbursed under a non-accountable plan? So that means that the employer doesn't have an accountable plan in place. They're not requiring certain types of documentation for the expense. This is a bad scenario for the employee. Because now the employee has to include the reimbursement in income. And they receive an itemized deduction for the expense subject to the 2% floor. So if Frank goes and spends $100 um, for um, tolls on the Jersey Turnpike, to get to see a client, and his pool, but it's not done under an accountable plan. Then the employer gives them $100 as reimbursement. Now that $100 is income to Frank, and if he itemizes, he can take a deduction for $100, but remember, it's subject to that 2% floor. So what that 2% floor does is it says you only get to take a deduction to the extent these items exceed 2% of your AGI. If they don't exceed 2% of your AGI, you don't get the deduction. So this is not a good situation for an employee to be in. And unfortunately, the employee has no say in whether the employer has an accountable plan or not. Honestly, to the employer, it's all the same. But so these are the, the really the four different ways that business expenses can show up 
depending upon if you have your own business, you're self-employed, all above the line, easy to report on Schedule C. If you're an employee, we have some additional questions we have to ask. One, is it reimbursed or is it unreimbursed? If it's reimbursed, is there an accountable plan? Because that will change your answer. Now let's continue to talk about the tax consequences a little bit more. If you are self-employed or an independent contractor, we have discussed this before, but it's been a while. If you will remember, you have to pay self-employment taxes. Or payroll taxes, whichever you would like. Employment taxes, self-employment taxes, etc. Which are approximately about 15%. Remember, this is separate from income taxes. Okay, this is in addition to income taxes. But what about if you're an employee? You do not, the, the, if you are an employee, the employer Basically here, I'll put here, employer pays zero. Pays no taxes. And the employee, or I should really not say the employee, I'll say the worker, pays self-employment taxes. If you are an employee, the employer pays payroll taxes. All right, okay, this goes down here. So, if you're an employer, which would you rather have? An independent contractor or an employee? A contractor. That's right, an independent contractor, why? You don't have to pay taxes on them, just what you pay them. That's right, you don't have to pay taxes on them, you give them a 1099, and you're done. Nothing to report to the government, um, technically, you do have to report who you give a 1099 to, but you don't have to pay payroll taxes and make quarterly payroll tax payments. So, an employer says, I'd rather have an independent contractor. Now, what about an employee? Would they, or a worker, I should say, would they rather be an independent contractor or an employee? An employee. Why do you think so? Because the, empl the employer is paying payroll taxes? The truth is, it just depends on the person. Because there are benefits to being both. If you're self-employed, you get above the line deductions of all your business expenses. You don't have to worry about any of them being itemized. But on the other hand, you have to pay 15% self-employment tax. So it really just depends upon the type of person, the type of business they have, as to which they would weather be. The people that are better at keeping up with their expenses and their receipts, they probably would rather be self-employed. But I know a lot of people that own their own business that can't keep up with their expenses. All they'll do is report their income to the government and not report any expenses because they can't keep up with it. Well, that sucks, and that's kind of stupid in my opinion. But there are people that do that. If that's the case, that type of person would much rather be in so, it just depends upon the person. But the employer absolutely would rather have independent contractors from a tax perspective. There are other things to consider in a legal perspective. We're not going to talk about that. We talk about that in a B law class, but not in this class. So, the next question is all right, how do you know? Do I have an employee? or do I have an independent contractor? It's not always abundantly clear, and it depends upon the facts. So, like for example, let's say you have somebody come in to your business, and you've decided you want to start using a cloud to back up all of your data, okay? Not at people, but you want to start using all the cloud so you need a whole new system put in place, and you hire an IT consultant to come in 
and spend two months at your facility getting everything organized, getting everything ready to move to this cloud-based system. Is that person an employee or an independent contractor? An independent contractor, probably. But the point is, sometimes it's not really clear. So we have these factors that are set forth in the rev rules, in a rev rule. There are 20 factors. And they're on page 9 4 of your book in concept summary 9 1. These are three big factors. But if you look at this, this, this page in the book, it really does lay out the different types of considerations. And I will tell you that the big thing to consider with employee versus independent contractor is control. How much control? Does the employer have over the worker? Can they tell them what time to be there? Can they tell them how long of a lunch break they get? Can they tell them what tools to use? If they have, the more control they have over the worker, the more it looks like an employee. The less control they have, the more it looks like someone who is self-employed or an independent contractor. If you have someone who not only works for you, but they also, you know, they don't just mow your yard, they mow two or three other yards down the street. You know, something like that. You know, your business is your or whatever. Okay, well now what you have is since that person is working for more people, it makes it look more like an independent contractor. If they're working just for you, and you tell them when to be there, and you provide the tools that they need to work work for you, it really looks like they're your employee. And I can tell you this is a real hot button issue for the IRS. They really like to audit people who say they have a lot of independent contractors. You can tell if they do because you have to check a box on your return that says you have 1099s that are issued and then the way that the um, deduction is made is different because if you're paying salaries there's a deduction for salaries and there's a deduction for basically 1099s so the way that it's reported is different so if the IRS sees that hmm this person has a lot of independent contractors that's a big audit flag for them and they will come in and audit and it's a big deal if they catch it because if they discover that you were claiming all these people were independent contractors and they were actually employees, not only can the IRS go back and charge payroll taxes, but the penalties are up to 80% of the taxes that you owe. And plus interest. So it's actually a huge deal if you get caught and you say, mm, I have five or six self-employed or independent contractors, and the IRS says, no, 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 these are employees, it could cost you a lot of money. So it's important that not only do you evaluate it at the beginning when you hire somebody, but continue to evaluate it every year. I've done a lot of due diligence, which is, um, when you have a purchaser looking to buy a Target, I would go in and look at the Target and see if there are any tax issues out there, kind of like a tax audit. And often there were issues associated with independent contractors. The people, companies were saying they had independent contractors, but really once you start asking more questions, they're probably not. And if the IRS catches wind of it, it's a big tax liability you've got in your hands. <laughs> And another, another one that they look at is um, basically how temporary the assignment is. So if you bring somebody in for two or three months to come and help you out, even if they're only working for you for two or three months, that really looks like someone who's an independent contractor because they're only there for one assignment, it's temporary, and then they're going to leave and they're going to go work for somebody else. But if they're there for a year or more, that's not really temporary. And I've had a deal like that where this company 
had a lot of computer engineers. And these, these were highly educated, highly paid people. And they had a lot of computer engineers. I mean, I'm going to say it was 30 of them. And they started out on a short-term assignment, three or four months. Two years later, they're still there. That means at some point, these people no, were not independent contractors anymore. They became employees, but they were still being treated as independent contractors. So that's a huge tax liability. You're talking about 30 people making $200,000 a year plus 80% penalties. That's a big problem. You're talking big money really quickly. So it is important that you get it right. And you can take a look at all the factors in the book, but I'll tell you that the big thing is control. How much control do they have over the employee? Is it a permanent work situation? Is it a temporary work situation? Those are the big things to consider. Um, before we move on, there's one, actually, one thing I forgot to discuss, and I need to discuss it. It's on page 95 of your book. It's called a statutory employee. A statutory employee is a type of employee that the code has said qualifies as basically your employer pays payroll tax. And the employee can still report their business expenses on Schedule C. Basically, as if they were self-employed. So this is really the best of both worlds here, right, for the employee. On the one hand, we get our payroll taxes paid. But on the other hand, we get to report all of our business expenses as an above-the-line deduction. Pretty sweet, right? Well, and a statutory employee only applies to a small number of professions, and the IRS tells you which ones they are. It says in the book, certain kinds of drivers, like non-dairy beverage distributors and laundry and dry cleaning pickup services, life insurance sales agents, home workers, and other types of sales persons. So, like someone who is basically selling for someone else. So you really do have to fit into one of those categories of people. And I want to bring this up because your primary taxpayer on your 1040 assignment, it tells you in the assignment that he is a statutory employee. So what does that mean to you? It means his business expenses are going to be reported on Schedule C but you don't have to calculate payroll taxes, thankfully. You don't have to worry about that. So just remember that. And in fact, a lot of the facts from your 1040 assignment are going to be covered in this chapter. So it's not a bad idea to take a look at the facts after we cover a topic and see if any of them apply to our taxpayer. And I can tell you there are two taxpayers, they're married. The husband, it tells you he's a statutory employee. So you know, okay, we're going to report his expenses on Schedule C. The other one, the wife, is an employee, and she has some unreimbursed employee expenses reported on Schedule A. So, okay. The next topic on slide six, we are going to talk about these different types of employee expenses in this chapter. Notice the slide says employee expenses. I don't want you to get confused. It really shouldn't say employee expenses. It should really say worker expenses. Because these actually, these deductions apply to people that are self-employed and to people that are employees. The fact that it says employee expenses, they don't actually mean you have to be an employee to take them. They apply whether you're here or whether you're here. But of course, the way that they were, will appear on your return is different depending upon if you are self-employed or employed. 
So let's talk about the first category here, which is transportation expenses. Okay. Let's differentiate for a minute between commuting expenses and transportation expenses. So if you are driving from your house to your normal work site every day, back and forth, that is commuting. And commuting is not deductible. Uh, and when I lived in Houston, there were people that worked in my office and they lived way the heck out there. It took them an hour and a half to get to work every day one way, some people more than that. And that's not deductible. It's a commuting, it's commuting. It sucks, but it's not deductible. But um, there are a couple minor exceptions down here if you're carrying heavy tools or something with you. But I want you to take a look at this chart here. The IRS made this chart. I've seen it on the IRS website. This chart shows you what type of transportation expenses are deductible. So if you look here, we have a taxpayer, and he has his little home here on the left, and on the right, he has his main job. Going back and forth is commuting expenses, and those are never deductible. But what if this taxpayer actually has a second job? So he has a main job, and then he has a second job. You can see the second job there on the bottom. Going from the regular job to the second job is deductible. Okay, so if you're going from your first job to your second job, that's deductible. And going from your second job home is deductible if you have worked at the main job already that day. What about, if you look here at the top, this is temporary work location. So a temporary work location, let, let, let's say you go into the office where you always go and you walk in, you're there 15 minutes and your boss says, hey, I need you to go out to X client and stay there for three or four hours and make sure they're auditing this inventory correctly. So then you get in your car and you go drive out to that client site. That's a temporary work location. Your, your travel expenses from your regular job to the temporary work location are deductible and your expenses from the temporary work location to home are deductible. So you can take a look at that chart and that helps you determine what is deductible. Of course you can, these are handouts, you can bring these with you on the exam if you want to. I'm not a chart person that I have difficulty in following stuff like this. Um, but it's honestly easier for me to just see things in paragraph format and to read it than it is for me to follow something like this. But everybody's different. Some people like these charts. So, so let's do a couple examples. Example four. Geraldo is employed by Sparrow Corporation. He drives 22 miles each way to work. Is there, are those 44 miles going to be deductible commuting, deductible expenses? No. It's commuting expenses, right? Not deductible. In the current year, Cynthia holds two jobs. A full-time job with Blue Court and a part-time job with Ring Court. This is example five. Cynthia customarily leaves home at 7.30 a.m. and drives 30 miles to Blue Court plant where she works until 5 p.m. After dinner at a nearby cafe, Cynthia drives 20 miles to Rencorp and works from 7 to 11 p.m. The distance from the second job to Cynthia's home is 40 miles. So, what is her deduction going to be? So, we're looking at, the first thing she does is she goes from her regular job to her second job. Is that deductible? Yes. 20 miles, that's deductible. The second thing she does is she drives home from her second job. Is that deductible? Yes. It says on the chart that it is, although it doesn't say in the book that it is, but it says in the chart that it is. So, 
and the IRS made this charge. So, okay, yes. Um, next, example six. Norman is the local manager for a national chain of fast food outlets. Each workday, he drives from his home to his office to handle administrative matters. Most of the day, however, is then spent making the rounds of the retail outlets, after which he drives home. The costs incurred in driving to his office and driving home from the last outlet, um, so basically, um, going to his main job and back to his house is not deductible, right? But during the day, he has all these temporary work assignments, or is going between those deductible. Yes, that part is deductible. That's right. Um, Vivian works for a firm in downtown Denver and commutes to work. She occasionally works in a customer's office. On one such occasion, she drove directly to the customer's office a round trip uh, of 40 miles. She did not go to her office that day. So she goes directly from her home to the temporary work location. Is that deductible? Yes, it is. That's right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, let's talk about what is considered to be a transportation expense. So, if we're talking about transportation expenses, we are usually talking about using your car and getting in it, getting in it to get somewhere. Okay, I guess it could be bus fare or public transportation, something like that. Um, but for the most part, people are talking about getting in their car. These are what your expenses are based off of: is your car. There are two different ways to deduct um, automobile expenses. And you have to choose one or the other. The first method is the actual expense method. With this method, it's really exactly like it sounds. You keep track of all your expenses related to your car and um, that's your deduction for whatever the business percentage is. Some of the things that count gas and oil, depreciation, insurance, dues to auto clubs, repairs, tires, registration fees, parking and tolls. That's on page 9-8. So what, what you might think counts. Okay? What about the automatic mileage method? This is the mileage rate that is set by the IRS every year. You guys probably know about this. 2016, it was 54 cents per mile. I don't know what it is in 17. I haven't checked. Um, with this method, you don't actually get to take your actual expenses, with the exception of parking and tolls. So you, this is on slide eight. You still get to take parking and tolls, but you only get to take 54 cents a mile for the actual miles driven for business. Your actual expenses, like gas and insurance and depreciation, it doesn't matter. People often like the automatic mileage method more because you don't have to keep up with receipts, but you do have to keep a mileage. So you have to keep a log saying, I went here to see this client on such and such day, and I went 10 miles, something like that. So let's do an example. There's not a good one in the book, but I have another one. Tom, a vet, uses his car to make house calls for sick animals. During 2016, he drove his car a total of 20,000 miles and 15,000 were for business purposes. His expenses related to his car 
or $4,500 for gas, repairs of $1,000, $500 for tires, $600 for insurance, $700 for car washes. Okay, so do you guys think all the, under the actual expense method, are all these things going to be deductible as transportation expenses? Yes, even the car washes can be. So all these things are fine. These are considered to be um, deductible transportation expenses, which equals $7,300, okay? But only 75% is related to business use. So you're not going to get to deduct $7,300. You're going to get to deduct 75% of $7,300. So that would be his deduction. It's 5475 under the actual expense method. If he had depreciation, he would also take depreciation here. Okay. So what about under the automatic mileage method? How would that work? Simple. 15,000 business miles times 54 cents a mile equals $8,100. So that you get to choose. Do you want to take this one or do you want to take this one? Which one is the taxpayer going to choose? That's right, the automatic. This is more, right? $8,100. So, question is, and the question is, can you change your mind every year? Can you flip back and forth between the actual and the automatic method? The answer is yes, you can. Usually, the only, the only exception when you can't is if you took a 179 depreciation expense on a car at the beginning, then no, you can't. But this guy, there's no mention of that, so we're to assume he didn't. Um, if he had taken a 179 depreciation expense, you have to stay with the actual expense method. But absent that, you can switch back and forth. One thing to be weary of, there's not really an issue with switching from this one to this one. That's not usually a problem. Um, let me go back to my notes. Just so. switching from um, right. if you are switching from this method to this method then you have to make an adjustment to the basis for depreciation deemed taken because if you're going he from he right here in this method you're not actually taking any depreciation you only get your automatic mileage plus parking and tolls. Whereas with the actual cost method, um, you get whatever your actual costs are, including depreciation. If you're switching from this method to this method, you do have to make an adjustment to the basis of the car for the depreciation that's deemed taken. So that is one thing to be weary of with switching back and forth. Right. You do have to make sure you keep ad adequate documentation 
of all things related to your car. This is one of those opportunities for taxpayers to manipulate the numbers. So a lot of documentation is actually required um, for automobile expenses. For those of you in my ethics class, we talked about this last week. This is one of these times when um, estimates are really not allowed. We have to keep real documentation. So, let's talk about the big picture facts. We have Morgan, she's going to have an office in her home. So that means her home is her principal place of business. If she does any, who does any traveling for business, then it's essentially going to be a transportation expense. Because her home is her place of business. So if she goes anywhere else, to visit a client, etc., that's a transportation expense. Okay. Now let's talk about travel expenses, which goes nicely along with transportation expenses. We're still talking about moving from one place to another. So, for it to be considered a travel expense, you have to be away from your tax home overnight. So, what that means is, there has to be some requirement that you have rest and sleep. If you get up at 3 a.m. and you take a flight for a business meeting in Chicago and you are home by midnight, that's not away from home. You do not get to take a deduction for your travel expenses in that situation because there's really no, what does it say? It need not be a 24 hour period, but it must be a period substantially longer than an ordinary day's work and must require rest, sleep, or relief from the work period. It's from a court case. So, and it says here, a 12 to 15 hour business trip from Chicago to LA and back on the same day is not away from home. So you have to think about that. Okay, so what if it is away from your tax home? The things you get to deduct are transportation, lodging, meals, and other miscellaneous expenses, like getting your laundry done, like getting your shoes shined, I guess, etc. So one question that comes up is, okay, well, what is your tax home? What does that mean, tax home, exactly? Okay, well, if you look at slide 12, tax home generally means a business location, post, or station of the taxpayer. So if we look in our book, example 15, we have Art, who's a physical therapist. His, he lives with his family in Pennsylvania, but for seven months out of the year, he lives in New Orleans and works for the New Orleans Saints. He gets paid $150,000 a year to work for those seven months, and in the five months out of the year that he lives in Pennsylvania, he works for the YMCA for $30,000 or $15,000. So is his tax home in New Orleans or is it in Pennsylvania? Well, it's going to be in New Orleans because that's really where he does his work. He gets an insubstantial salary uh, in Pennsylvania working for the YMCA, but most of his money comes from working in New Orleans. That's where he's getting his money. So what about when you are away from home for a temporary purpose? So you're working temporarily somewhere else in another city for maybe three or four months. That is considered to be away from your tax home and is basically travel expenses. So if we look at a couple more examples. Malcolm's employer, this is example 12, opened a branch office in San Diego. He works in LA. They asked Malcolm, to go for three months to San Diego to help get this branch off the ground. He started out commuting every day from LA to San Diego, which is quite a drive. It was taking him 
it just says several hours a day to drive. And he said, I can't do this anymore. So he rented an apartment in San Diego while he helped get this branch off the ground. All of his expenses related to renting his apartment, including meals, laundry, incidentals, automobile expenses in San Diego, they're all deductible because it's considered to be traveling away from home. Even though he's really in San Diego all week, he's only there for a temporary assignment. Now, if the company changes their mind and they say, you know what, we want you to stay there permanently, well then, San Diego is no longer traveling. San Diego becomes his tax home, and LA becomes the traveling. So, another thing the book mentions is sometimes a taxpayer doesn't really have a tax home. They're transient. Uh, it gives an example of a long haul truck driver who lists his mother's home as his address and stays there during holidays. Although he doesn't pay for any of the expenses of running the house, other than that, he really just kind of drives around the country in his truck. In that situation, the taxpayer's tax home is wherever he is. So he doesn't, he's never really traveling away from home. His home is basically his truck. My brother works on an offshore drilling platform, and when he's off, he doesn't really have a place to live. He just stays with whoever will let him stay there for free. So he's kind of, you know, in the same boat. It's like, well, who knows? Okay. There are some restrictions on travel expenses. Specifically, if you are going to a convention you only get to take a deduction for those travel expenses if it is related to your line of business. So if you have a doctor going to an out-of-state convention on estate planning, that's not related to his business and you don't get to take a travel expense deduction. Remember, we are talking about business deductions here. So it has to be related to the business that he's in. Now, if he went to a convention, if this doctor was a cardiothoracic surgeon and he went to a convention for heart doctors, well, that would be okay. And that's his deductible travel expense. What about if this convention was in Hawaii and he decided to take his wife? She's going to go and take notes for him at the convention. Well, you're not going to be able to deduct the spouse's travel expenses unless they, they're actually there for a bona fide business purpose. So if his wife was like a nurse in the practice and she needed to go, then that would be a bona fide business purpose. But just sitting there taking notes for him as a secretary is not considered to be enough to be able to deduct the spouse's expenses. Um. What about education? We're going to talk about education um, probably next week in a little bit more detail. But just traveling as a form of additional education is not actually deductible. Okay? Unless the education expense is deductible. So, for example, um, let's say um, Taylor wants to go to a CLE. Um, no, CPE, right, is what CPAs have to do every year. They have to get continuing education. So let's say you want to get some CPE credits for a conference, and it is in Orlando. So you decide to go to this conference in Orlando. Then, your, then that conference in itself is going to be deductible. We'll discuss why later. But if the conference is deductible, 
and the travel expenses to get there are deductible. But if you're just traveling as a form to get more information, as just education, not required education, that's required education for your license, that's not deductible. So we have a Spanish, Spanish professor going to Spain so that they can improve their language skills. That's not deductible. Okay? They're really just going for educational purposes. They don't have to go to Spain to improve their Spanish. They can watch Telemundo at home. Right? Okay. But what about if we have a Spanish history professor? traveling to Spain to study historical documents that are only available in Spanish museums. Well, that's different, because now they really have to go there to be able to study these documents for their business. It's not really for educational purposes that they're going. I mean, it's hard when you have a professor when they're in the business of education but they're really going to study these documents that are only available in Spain. So, what about when you have a, um, you're traveling for work, and the travel has components of both pleasure and business, as conferences often do. That's why conferences are at fun locations. You don't see a lot of conferences in Cleveland or Detroit, right? They're always in Hawaii or Orlando or Boston. Some more fun. Not that Cleveland's not fun. I'm sure it is. I've never been. Um, anyway, so there's usually some form, often there is, some form of pleasure involved in business trips. So the question is, all right, do I get to deduct these travel expenses if there are components of bit of business and pleasure? Well, there are two different standards. It depends on if the trip is domestic or foreign. So if you have a domestic trip, we're going to talk about domestic trip first. I don't actually have any idea why we have different standards for domestic versus foreign. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but we do. So, if you have domestic travel, and the primary purpose is business, the transportation is deductible in full. However, um, if the primary purpose is pleasure, there is no deduction for transportation. What about all the other expenses of travel? So transportation is only one expense of travel, right? What about meals, lodging, incidentals? All those are expenses related to travel. Those other expenses must be prorated. They have to be prorated whether the primary purpose is business or not. It doesn't matter. You still have to prorate the other expenses. So let's look at an example. In the current year, this is example 22, Hannah travels from Seattle to New York primarily for business. She spends five days conducting business and three days sightseeing. Her plane and taxi fare are 1160. 
So eleven sixty is her transportation expenses, right? These transportation expenses are deductible in full, correct? Because the primary purpose is business. Okay? She also has meals, which are $200 a day. And lodging, which is $300 a day. So now we have to prorate these other travel expenses. Six meals are $200 a day, and five days was for business. We'll take 200 times five days equals $1,000. Now there is, an addition, there is an additional limitation related to meals, and we'll talk about it next week. But I want to just point it out to you now because it would be incorrect to keep going without stating it. Meals are always subject to a 50% limit. There are a couple minor exceptions, but this isn't one of them. So that means with this $1,000, she's only going to get to deduct um, five of it. That's just always the rule for meals. And we'll talk about that next week. And then the lodging, which is $300 a day, also times five days, is $1,500. So we have a deduction of $1,500 plus $500 plus $1,160. So if Hannah is self-employed, how will this deduction show up? How will it be reported? That's right, it's on Schedule C, as above the line deductions. If she is an employee and they are unreimbursed expenses, then it would all be an itemized deduction, right? Subject to that 2% floor. So, as you can see, the calculation is the same for employee versus self-employed. We have the same number. The difference is how it's going to be reported on the tax return. But the rules are the same. I'll tell you what, when we come back next week, we are going to pick up with the rule for foreign travel because I don't think we can finish it in five minutes. So we'll come back to the rule for foreign travel when we come back. Remember, we do not have class on Monday for Easter break. Okay?